Good evening, folks. It's good to see you out tonight. We want to give a special word of welcome to the Reverend Joseph Andrews to the pulpit tonight. Joseph, it's good to have you. Uh, elders session meeting on the 17th, Tuesday night week. And remember the midweek and Wednesday night again. Uh, they're at 8 o'clock. And these are all the announcements. Andrew, thank you very much for your welcome. It's good to be back with you in Glen Wherry. I was just thinking, usually most times when I come, I'm sitting down there with a few ministers and elders. It's not often I get the opportunity to minister God's word, but we're delighted tonight to be here and to have the opportunity to meet with you around the word of God. The, the prophet Isaiah says, Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid. For the Lord God is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. We're going to join together in the worship of God. And we're going to sing the praise, Behold our God who has held the oceans in his hand. our hearts in prayer. Let us come into God and God's presence and engage with him in prayer. Let us pray. Lord our God, we have been singing our praise to you. Behold our God, come, let us adore him. And now, Father, 
we come to seek you in prayer. And we come to bring you our worship and service because you alone are God. You are the only true and living God. And you alone are to be worshipped and adored. O Lord God, we dare not give this honour to any other, because if we dare to do so, we break your commandment, you shall worship the Lord your God, and him only shall you serve. We are not free to choose how we should worship you, For you have revealed to us in your word how you are to be worshipped. You have declared yourself to be the God of utmost holiness. And you have commanded us to come to you only in the name and through the mediation of the one whom you have appointed as our mediator and intercessor, the Lord Jesus Christ. You have clearly stated in the scripture there is one God and one mediator between God and man, the man Christ Jesus. We come to you in his name tonight. We come to you through his righteousness and his merits this evening. Father, we acknowledge his sufficiency as saviour and redeemer. We acknowledge that He laid down his life on the cross for the sin of your people. We acknowledge that his righteousness alone is sufficient to justify all those whom you sent him to save. And oh, as we come before you tonight, Father, we also acknowledge that even though, Father, we have been so blessed even we have, though we have enjoyed the benefits of your great salvation. Yet, Lord, in carelessness and in ingratitude, we still continue to sin. But how we bless you, Father, that even then, Jesus is the, the all-sufficient Saviour, For your word tells us that if we do sin, we have an advocate with the Father, Jesus Christ the righteous. Thank you, Lord, that we've been able to worship you as a company of your people already today. But Father, even this day, this day set aside for you, We have offended you in so many ways. We have failed to render to you the obedience that you require from us. And so as we come to worship tonight, Father, we come confessing our sin and pleading only the death and the righteousness, the merits of Jesus for our forgiveness. Lord, we ask this evening, that, that joy and confidence, that reverence and submission may characterize the worship which we offer. And we ask this all in Jesus' name. Amen. We're going to turn this evening to Mark's Gospel, and we're going to read the, the first eight verses. Mark chapter 1, reading the first eight verses, and this is God's Word. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. 
the voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make his path straight. John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. And all the country of Judea and all Jerusalem were going out to him and were being baptized by him in the river Jordan, confessing their sins. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt around his waist and ate locusts and wild honey. And he preached, saying, After me comes one who is mightier than I, the strap of whose sandals I am not worthy to stoop down and untie. I have baptized you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. Amen. And we do pray that God will bless his word to us this evening. And now, at this point in our service, we bring our offering to the Lord. Oh, sorry, sorry, I've, I've, I've mixed this up. I'm thinking about old habits die hard. I was going to say I'm thinking of another place here. We're going to sing again. We're going to sing, uh, Guide me, O thou great Jehovah, pilgrim through this barren land.
Let us again engage with God in prayer. Let us pray. Almighty God, we have been using words in our praises tonight which speak of your greatness and your majesty. The one seated on a throne, our great Jehovah, our great Redeemer. You are the sovereign God. You rule over heaven and earth. You rule over time and eternity. And Father, we come to you to worship you this evening. And we do so in the the midst of a period of, of local and national and global uncertainty. There is the war in Ukraine. The cost of living crisis. The outcome of the election in our own province. These are issues that get reported on the news, Father, but there are other issues that weigh heavily on individuals at this time. And Father, these things and and so many others are beyond our ability to influence or to control, to remedy and at times even to, to understand. Many are fearful for the future. Others are desperately worried about their health or treatment that they need to receive. Many are concerned about how they will cope if costs increase any more. Father, in these days, Give us the same understanding of the reality of the world and the the, the situation in which we live as the psalmist had. And give us the same confidence in your sovereign purposes which enabled him to say, I trust in you, O Lord. I say, you are my God. My times are in your hand. Rescue me from the hand of my enemies and and from my persecutors and make your face shine on your servant. Save me in your steadfast love. For the people of Ukraine tonight, sheltering from missile or gun attack for the people of this province or this land or this world wondering what the future will hold or wondering how they will cope if prices continue to rise for those grappling with their own individual problems may they be able to say tonight, you are my God. And may they understand that their times are in your hand. Father, may we all rest in your sovereign, good, and perfect plan and will. And Lord, we thank you tonight that your word, the Bible, contains and reveals your will completely. And Father, we, we thank you that this congregation is encompassed within the sovereign purposes of the Almighty God. We pray you will be with them during this time of vacancy. Guide them as they look to the future and may they see indeed that their times are in your hand. Lord, we thank you that Scripture also contains everything that we need to believe in order to be saved, that it is there, it is sufficient, doesn't need to be adjusted or added to or subtracted from. 
And Lord, as we turn to the scriptures this evening, so be pleased to open our hearts and minds to receive your truth and anoint, Father, in the power of the Holy Spirit, the preaching and the hearing of your word to the glory and honor of Jesus Christ, our Savior and Mediator. Amen. Our next praise says, When I fear my faith will fail, Christ will hold me fast. got your Bible, I, I want you to turn with me this evening to the beginning of um, Mark's Gospel. And even in those words of introduction, there is something that should make us sit up and, and take notice right away. Mark isn't writing a, a news report. He's not writing a magazine article. He's not even writing a letter. He tells us what he is writing in the, in the opening words of his gospel. He says, the beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. 2,000 years ago, there was nothing particularly Christian about the use of the word gospel. It simply meant an important announcement or a message conveying good news. 
it was generally used to announce the succession of a new emperor in Rome. And at a time when Rome basically ruled all of the civilized world, you couldn't get bigger or more important news than that. Now Mark says, I'm writing here because I have got not just really important news, but I have got the most important news of all to announce. He lets us know in the very beginning of his, his gospel that he is writing to convey a message. And he tells us right at the start, in the early verses, what this message is going to be. So what I want us to do this evening is to consider the message that Mark wants to convey. First of all, verse 1 provides the setting of the message. It tells us who the message is all about. The beginning of the gospel of Jesus Christ, the Son of God. Now Mark's gospel, as far as we can work out, was written around about the mid-60s AD to Christians who were living at the very center of the Roman Empire, who were living in the city of Rome. Now that wasn't a particularly good time to be a Christian in Rome. In AD 64, a fire devastated nearly 80% of the city. The emperor at the time was a man called Nero. And Nero probably had a mental issue. He was totally irrational. He just didn't know the limits of, of decent behavior. And Nero was widely suspected of being behind the fire in his own city. And so as the citizens of Rome tried to clear up the mess and tried to get their, their belongings and their lives and their businesses up and going again, tried to mourn their dead, you know, there were whispers going about. What kind of boy is Nero? He's burnt the whole city down on us. Like, you know, there's something not right here. And it was suddenly looking very precarious for this man who basically was an unhinged ruler. You remember back 40 years ago, 1982, this time of year, the month of May, we were actually at war. The Argentinian dictator General Galtieri was under a lot of pressure and he was, he was getting the blame for the poor state of his country's economy. And he, he needed to uh, defect, deflect uh, attention from all of this. And so what did he do? Well, he invaded the, the Falkland Islands. And one of the oldest tricks in the book is for an unsuccessful government, when they're in trouble, to try and divert attention. And, and, and back in AD 64, Nero, Nero did exactly the same. He shifted the blame for the great fire of Rome to the Christians. And then he moved with horrendous cruelty against them. Um, Christians were arrested. They were clothed in the skins of, of, of wild animals. And, and feral dogs were let loose against them. Others were dipped in tar and, and then they were set alight and their air burning uh, bodies were used to uh, illuminate Nero's private uh, gardens. Others were brought into the, the Colosseum. They were fed to lions for entertainment. It was so bad that Christians couldn't meet any longer in public, but they had to worship underground in, in burial chambers. 
Now, if you were a Christian in Rome in AD 64 or thereabouts, the one thing that you really wanted to be reassured about, that Jesus really is a person worth believing in. You needed to be able to link um, faith in Jesus Christ. You needed to be able to link that to, to God, the sovereign God of Scripture and to his purposes. You needed to be able to see beyond your, your present horrendous circumstances and, and get your eyes fixed on an eternal reality. And you needed to be sure that that was, that was real, that was genuine. You, you really want to know, and you want to know for sure, that what you have in Jesus, the, the, the Savior to whom you are being asked to commit yourself, that, that, that this is really something which is both of God and as part of God's plan for the redemption of his people. Now in the, 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 the multi-faith, humanist, orientated society of 2021, anyone who is, or sorry, 2022, anyone who is either a follower of Jesus or who is seriously considering becoming a follower of Jesus or, or even struggling to get their head around the gospel message they need to be reassured about exactly the same things. They need to be convinced about exactly the same truth. So let's take the rest of our time this evening and, and look at how Mark addresses these issues. The first thing I want you to see here is that Mark says this message that I am bringing to you folks is the message which is grounded in God's eternal purposes. Look at um, verses 4 and verse 6. We read there that John appeared, baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. Then we're told what he looked like. Now John was clothed with camel's hair and wore a leather belt round his waist and ate locusts <clears throat> and wild honey. Now before Mark describes John's appearance, he actually ties in John's arrival with something which was foretold in the Old Testament. And he, he basically gives a summary of three Old Testament texts. One's from Exodus, one's from Malachi, one's from Isaiah. And these prophecies all foretold that before the Messiah, before the promised Redeemer would come, God would send someone. And here's the someone. This guy called John. Now it's, it's round about AD 30. Word is starting to spread about this preacher who had appeared in the wilderness. And everybody was talking about how he dressed. Because his dress wasn't exactly first century AD contemporary. He's, he's wearing a, a coat of camel hair. He's wearing a leather belt round his waist. In fact, if truth were told, his death, his uh, address is really retro. That's the way that the prophets of the Old Testament dressed. Um, way back in uh, 2 Kings uh, chapter 1 and verse 8, um, the authorities are questioning some people about the identity of an individual whom they have seen. And the people's response is, well, look, he, he wore a garment of hair and a belt of leather about his waist. And straight away, the king, the king's authorities, they know who it is. And they say, it's Elisha, the, it's Elijah the, the, the Tishbite. It was the prophet Elijah. And, and actually, people 
we discover, began to speculate that John might actually be Elijah alive again in, in, in 1 John, in, in, sorry, in John 1 and verse uh, 21, they asked him, what then? Are you Elijah? And, and John says, no, no, I'm, I'm not. You see, John met the classic image of the prophets of the Old Testament. The, the people who looked at him, well, they just thought, here's, here's somebody who steps straight out of the pages of our Bible. If you go on uh, a wee bit further then, let's have a look at verses 2 and 3. So we've got John, we've got the description of him. He looks just like some guy straight out of the pages of the Old Testament. And then Mark tells us, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet, Behold, I send my messenger before your face, who will prepare your way. The voice of one crying in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make his paths straight. So here is John's message. And as I said earlier, Mark here is tying together three Old Testament prophecies, one from Isaiah, one from Malachi, one from Exodus. So the people were, were asking the question, is faith in Jesus linkable to God and to his purposes? Is, is Jesus the one through whom God brings salvation to his people? And Mark says, guys, my answer is a resounding yes. Here's the Messiah. And before the Messiah, here's the one who would come to prepare the way for his coming. In other words, everything that you're going to hear about Jesus, says Mark, in my gospel is in perfect harmony with all that you find in the God-breathed scriptures. So look, if you're getting a hard time tonight as a Christian, if you're maybe not a Christian tonight, but, but you're, you're, you're just wondering, you know, can I really... Trust the gospel. Can I really let go of everything I'm building on for my salvation and, and, and lay hold of Jesus? Well, you needn't fear that the gospel that calls you to faith alone and Jesus alone for salvation from sin, you needn't fear that this is something maybe different from or in addition uh, to what the Presbyterian church believes or teaches. Because with the Bible, alongside the word of God, the Presbyterian church teaches and believes that it is through faith alone and in Jesus alone that people enter into God's promised salvation. When we declare the gospel of Jesus Christ, we believe, we teach that this is how God always planned and purposed to bring people into the benefits of his salvation. When, when, when you are called to exercise faith in Jesus alone, you are called to do something which is perfectly in line with which God's plan to redeem his people has always been. And then there's this statement at the beginning of verse 4. John appeared baptizing in the wilderness. Now, the Old Testament saw great significant in the wilderness. My daily Bible notes at the minute were reading through the early chapters of Exodus. And, and there we are told that it was to the wilderness, it was to the desert region that, that God brought his people when he wanted to, to meet with them. Exodus uh, 19 and, and, and verse 2 says that when God brought his people 
out of Egypt, he, he says, look, I want to meet you in the wilderness at Mount Sinai. And so they set out from, from Rephidim and they came to the wilderness of Sinai and encamped in the wilderness. There Israel encamped before the mountain. Steve Wilmerst, in his commentary on Mark, has something to say about the significance of the wilderness. Listen to this. Time and time again in the Bible, the desert is where God's people, God takes people to meet with him. He takes them away from places where they are comfortable. The busy situations they are embroiled in. He takes them out where there are no distractions and they can hear him speaking. It is a biblical pattern. And here it happens again. And he says, even today, the Lord so often takes us away to a place where we have no resources of our own, a place that feels dead and dry, so that we can hear his voice without distinction. God meets you today, not out in the middle of some desert somewhere. God meets you today in his word in the scriptures. And as you, you, you study these verses along with me tonight, as you read through your Bible, God is he's taking you away from your everyday situation. He's, he's maybe making you feel uneasy. He's maybe making you feel uncomfortable as he confronts you with the fact of your sinfulness before him. He's, he's stripping away perhaps your reliance on what you think you can do to put things right between you and him. You see, God in Scripture, through the power of the Holy Spirit, brings you to the point where you see that in and of yourself you have nothing which can contribute to your salvation from sin. And so you can only rely on the completed work of Jesus, the work which he accomplished on the cross to put away your sin, to provide you with the righteousness that you need to be accepted by God. If you're wondering tonight, how is God going to speak to me? How is God going to convince me that, what, what, that, that Jesus is the only way of salvation? Go back to scripture and read it. And expect God to speak to you through the pages of his word. I think I'm going to need some, some help, Martin. This is okay. If it's not going to go any further, that's all right. We've all got Bibles and we can... Okay, we've got it. No, it's the one before that. It's verse 4. Yep. If we go to verse 4, all right? John appeared. We've looked at the significance of what he was wearing and his appearance. What's he doing? He's baptizing in the wilderness and proclaiming a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sin. Now here again, we're seeing a connection with something that God had made known in the, the Old Testament. You see, the Jewish people had been given various regulations. Regulations which involved baptism, sprinkling with water or, or sometimes blood. And, and sometimes the water or the blood was sprinkled using a sprig of, of hyssop. Other times it was done by the priest's hand. For example, God had, had instructed that such sprinkling was how the Levites were to be ritually cleansed and made acceptable for the work in the tabernacle or, or, or the temple. Sprinkling, for example, with water symbolized cleansing from sin and unfitness for God's holy presence. And uh, along with the sprinkling of baptism, the word repentance is used here. 
Now, the Greek word for repentance is, is metanoia. It means a, a, a complete change of mind. Repentance is a word that, that expresses sorrow for sin. Not just for what sin has done to me or the mess it has got me into, but what my sin has done to my relationship with God, the offense that it has been to his holy majesty. Repentance can be a change of our, our fundamental attitudes and outlook on life. It can be the changing of our whole orientation and, and the reorientation of our whole life in a different direction. Donald English once wrote that the prophets had regularly called the people to do this. And they meant not just a change of mental attitude, but a total commitment to serving God, relying on his strength, doing his will, and living in his people. What does that mean for us in 2022? What does it look like? Well, it's not only regretting and, and, and mourning and turning away from a, a specific sin or, or something terrible in, in your life. Rather, it's what's spoken of in Shorter Catechism 87. Repentance on to life is a saving grace by which a sinner being truly aware of his sinfulness understands the mercy of God in Christ grieves for and hates his sins and turns from them to God fully intending and striving for new obedience repentance unto life as you and I realizing that all our life we've been living out a sort of self-made salvation understanding that, that our attitude or our, our belief system up until this point if you like has, has been that, that, that we're going to be forgiven because of what we can contribute or, or we're going to be able to do something to make ourselves right with God and encourage God uh, to forgive us and realizing that that mindset has got it all wrong Repentance unto life is understanding that the debt which our sin incurred is so great. The deficit of our, our righteousness before God is so large that we can't hope to repay it. We understand that we must rely only on the Savior whom God has appointed to do all this for us. For only Jesus can pay the infinite debt which we owe to God. And he did that only as he died on the cross. And so we turn from our self-reliance and, and emptiness. And we rest on him alone for, for all the benefits of God's salvation. If you have trusted in him, all those benefits are yours in him. And that's good news indeed. And that is the gospel. Let us pray. <clears throat> oh Lord God, we come at the end of our time together tonight to thank you for Jesus. To thank you that in him all the, the, the promises of the Old Testament are fulfilled. To thank you, Father, that every prophecy made about him, everything symbolized in the Old Testament ritual, has now come to fulfillment in the person of your own perfect divine Son. Thank you, Lord, that taking our human flesh, 
he went to the cross and there offered the only sacrifice that could turn away your wrath from us by satisfying it fully, paying our debt completely. Thank you that his righteousness justifies us in your sight. And oh, Father, we praise you. Our our spirits leap up and rejoice tonight because all this is ours. All this is ours in Christ and it is due to your free grace alone. Therefore, Lord, send us home tonight rejoicing in your grace, rejoicing in the, the reality of the gospel in our own lives and equip us to live with confidence the calling which you have laid before us in in Christ Jesus. To your honor, your glory, your praise. Amen. Now we join together to sing our closing praise. Be thou my vision, O Lord of my heart. of the Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us and with all his people now and forevermore. Amen.